whirling dervish. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on the just gentleman date. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. Action pack show plan for you today. <laughs> Matt Belinsky is back in studio. Tech, business, and media attorney. Uh, he's got the podcast, as formerly mentioned, the prevailing narrative. And um, Matt's a guy who studies things and then comes up with correct <laughs> conclusions. Uh, crazy uh, Twitter thread with you and the L.A. Times. Uh, I've been in Los Angeles my entire life. You would just go to the L.A. Times to get your news and your information like you would go to Sports Illustrated back in the day and get your news and information. And something happened along the way. And I keep saying... I get that's how you feel, but why are you ruining your Tiffany franchise? But you tell us. Well, I think there's what's happened with the LA Times is kind of in running in parallel with what happened with generally the entire publishing industry, right? We see. Sorry, pull the mic up. Yeah. Lean up. Sorry. <clears throat> Just start over there. No, nah, you got it. So what you see happening with the LA Times is kind of running in parallel with what you see about the entire publishing industry in that it was kind of contaminated by this kind of youthful progressivism that that is just the dominant ethos of the people that work at, that have joined these organizations over the past 10, 15 years. And even the older regime at these at these publications, even up to the New York Times, kind of drifted in the direction of the youth, more youthful politics, right? It's almost mm-hmm. like the tail wags the dog. And so you right. saw that happening with the LA Times. I mean, I have my theories on structure why that's happened to all journalism. And I think to a certain extent, it's because with the shift from analog to digital, scarcity was released. And all of a sudden, when you you know go from printing 15, 17 stories a day to 200 stories a day, you know, supply goes up and quality goes down, right? It's almost like a restaurant or a club. You have to let in more people to make the business model work. All of a sudden, the quality goes down. I think that's a major factor. So that was one factor that's present for the LA Times and just about all of the publishing. The LA Times was also one other catalyst that I think a lot of, well, shockingly, almost nobody was aware, and that's kind of what gave rise to my thread and why it's become a popular one, in that the owner of the LA Times, a guy named Patrick Soon Chiang, Pretty low profile guy, strangely, given the things that he's involved in. He's an owner of the Lakers and an owner of the LA Times. He bought Magic Johnson's share in 2011. I forgot why Magic had to sell, but he had to sell about 5% of the Lakers. Patrick Soon Xiong bought it. Very low profile guy for an owner of the Lakers. He buys the LA Times in 2018. As you know, 2020 is coming along and you know, we see the deterioration of Los Angeles. I'm trying to investigate what's happening here. And one of the things that I see at the LA Times is that there's a very prominent voice in the editorial room, and that's Patrick Soon Xiong's daughter, Nika. Nika is the most cliched blueprint champagne socialist, guilt-ridden rich kid that ascribes herself to progressive politics very aggressively and just the most out-of-touch, broken, bankrupt worldview. And she was being very aggressive and almost kind of running the newsroom. And you saw that, and it, it popped up most evidently in 2022 because there were LA elections that year. That was right just before those last time I was on describing this and when that thread came around. And it turns out that she's engineering some of the candidates for some of these positions in LA because they're friends of hers. It's a guy named Kenneth Mejia. He's the the LA controller now. He's about 33 now. He was 31 when he was elected. He has no qualifications whatsoever, except for being friends with Nika Soon-Shiong and was able to be engineered there because the LA Times endorsed him. Okay, had no business endorsing him. And people, as you mentioned, Adam mentions, people usually go to the LA Times for their news to to see what's going on in LA. And while it no longer has the circulation or prestige it once had, in terms of endorsements and who gets elected in LA, still extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. You know how many candidates won in the 2020 elections that were not endorsed by the LA Times? Tell us. One. One. One person out of it's got to be at least 18 to 20 that was not endorsed by the LA Times once. The LA Times endorsements are still extremely powerful. And the people they're endorsing are just, uh, that's why LA is going in the direction that it's going in, because these are people that ascribe to, you know, a level of progressive politics that, you know, we, you, uh, all of us sit here and our mind is blown. And how are these people being elected? It's because most people don't pay attention. They go to the endorsement section of the LA Times. They see, oh, the LA Times couldn't endorse someone who is is this broken or is, will be this harmful? And they assume it's somebody that's you know sufficient, that's who they vote for. And the LA Times keeps on winning and part of it and the people who are winning as a function of that are somewhat forwarded by Nika Soon-Shiong. Right, so let's, let's give some background here. First off with Nika, 
So she does consider herself an activist, has a master's in African studies and a BA <laughs> in international relations from Stanford. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, despite a 137% oh. rise in crime in West Hollywood, she was involved with defunding the sheriff's department. She was on the, the safety commission. Yeah. yeah, the yeah. Safety. She, should be, she should be serving lattes at a Pete's Coffee, but <laughs> right. she's on the safety okay, commission. Okay, so... And now, uh, and so even more background. So the reason that we're talking about the LA Times so much cause, is because they just laid off uh, a little over 20% of their newsroom, about 115 people being reported. They're saying it's because there's been about a 30 to $40 million loss in mm-hmm. profits and er, earnings. And um, a lot of it's because of people are going to social media now. So they got rid of their whole video department. They got mm-hmm. rid of a lot of it. They're, they're trimming the fat, the meat, and just really leaning out their staff. Yeah. So I think to put it in another sort of parlance, and I've always kind of said this, you know, you had the old guard that was in there. Now, I was very good friends with the editor in chief of the, of the Times for many, many years, still friends with him, Shelby Coffey III. And I met him in the mid, early mid 90s. Probably met Shelby 92. And he was the guy who ran. And uh, he was a gray-haired white guy who was uh, like boxing and sports and drove a Corvette. And uh, he and I were great friends, even though I was very low on the socioeconomic totem pole. Uh, but I was his boxing coach. And he discovered that I had some homespun wisdom, even without – he was used – he comes from D.C., I think, he runs in those circles. But he sort of was like, hey, you got some smarts, you know, kid. And, uh, you know, we find ourselves uh, having lunch and just talking about life and subjects and things like that. I remember one time telling him, because this is a long time ago, I was always pretty progressive. I was like, oh, let's just legalize prostitution and legalize pot and, like, legalize drugs. Like, well, you know, what's the harm? And I remember he said, no, you know, nothing's really the harm, but is do you want to live in that society? And I was sort of like... Yeah, I, I kind of get what his point is, but I don't know what his politics were, but he was a little old school and somewhat conservative and that he was pushing back on me talking about legalizing drugs and prostitution and things like that. And and that was those he was a prototype for the guys who ran newspapers yes. from the old <clears throat> school. Then he moved out and the new school moved in. And I I would describe it this way. If. You know, back in the, you know, 60s, 70s, whenever, what percentage of the employees of the L.A. Times would have been vegan? Okay, less than 1%. 1% will be generous and round up to 1%. But what if the meat eaters started getting pushed out and the vegans started replacing them? And before you know it, it's 67% vegan. Now what's on the menu for lunch? And it's bean curd. That's yeah. what's on. We're, we're barbecue day and rib day and burger day and pizza day, th- th- those are gone. It's vegan day now. And so I feel like with each graduating class of young, polluted-minded kids that are going to these places with their vegan agenda, then what's going to start? Okay, so then the lunchroom gets taken over by the vegans, and there's no more jerky treats in the vending machine. And before you know it, we start seeing more articles about the benefits of the vegan lifestyle in the newspaper. And if you just kind of use that as a metaphor, that's essentially what's happening times the nation. De- definitely what, how you describe it is reflective, but I think there's, there's two dynamics also at play. One, people, and what I mentioned about scarcity and the switch from analog to digital. Quality goes down, so does the pay and the compensation of the reporters. Thus, the quality of the report is going down. Okay, when uh, you're, when Shelby ran the LA Times newsroom, a job at the LA Times was difficult to get. There was a threshold to cross to get that job, and you were paid relatively well. You know, you weren't a millionaire, but you were paid pretty well. These people, the LA Times, they're glorified bloggers making $58,000, $62,000 a year, right? And a lower quality of person, a lower quality of journalist is going to take that job. So not only is it more vegans, uh, it's more vegans who simply are less qualified and, you know, know, took <laughs> nutrition at Cal State Northridge instead of UCLA or USC. That's one of the things that's at play. Two, it's, and I think a lot of people who are a little more surface 
uh, uh, on the only surface aware of these types of issues always think it's top down, that these types of things happen um, because there might be an editor or a family or an owner that that believes these things and that's what influences the paper. But what, what was on point about what you said is that it's actually bottom up and that with more vegans in the newsroom or more people who ascribe to these politics, it doesn't matter who's running it, right? Because they're pressuring the bosses because the interesting thing about the, the, this recent chaos and drama with the LA Times is the, man, the senior editor uh, resigned and that's what set off a lot of the media blitz about what's going on there, a big Hollywood Reporter article. And a guy named Kevin Morita, who was uh, only three years in the job at the Los Angeles Times, Patrick Soon-Shiong apparently recruited this guy heavily to run the LA Times. He, I don't recall what his prior job was, but he's very well regarded in the journalism world. Uh, apparently he lived, you know, he was recruited, here's a million dollars a year and come live in Patrick Soon-Shiong's $75 million house guest room. Um, and that's how he convinced Kevin Morita to take this job. Morita was pushing back against Nika and the more progressive, younger younger cohort at the LA Times. And finally, about a week ago, he couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, mm. so I think about, and maybe in this particular case, there's so much independent wealth that it really can be a lost leader for these guys. But I always sort of generally subscribe to the argument that everything is sort of economically sort of shaped or pushed or something. And so more metaphors, but if I got myself uh, an In-N-Out Burger franchise, not in Oakland, because they had to move. <laughs> By the way, that's the only In-N-Out franchise ever in 75 years to shutter their doors and so windows. Sad. One, okay, Oakland. That'd be the shocker. one. That'd be the That'd one. That'd be the one. Okay, but let's defund that police. <laughs> so, if I just took over a franchise and I was like, "Look, new new policy." We're going to be hummus centric here. We're going to focus on hummus and pita, and uh, no more animal style. We'll do a single burger, but we're not doing double doubles anymore. And we're really going to push to hummus. And everyone sort of looked at me and went, "Okay, boss, you know, you're the boss." Um, and then we got our quarterly sales reports in, and they were down sixty one percent. And then the next one we got, we're down eighty six percent. At some point, as the franchise owner, I'd be like, you know what? I made a mistake with the whole hummus thing. Let's let's roll it back. Let's get into the animal style. Let's dance with who brung us. Um, why is that not more? I mean, SI, Bud Light, it happened kind of kind of overnight. But there are many examples of many publications that are starting a long, slow decline and slide in, in revenue and readership and stuff. How come there's no point where somebody pumps the brakes and goes, we're not in the hummus business, people. We slaughter cows. Let's get back to this. And, and Adam, you and I talked about this the last time because you asked me, <clears throat> what's the business model of this? And I said, how's the business model working? And I said, the business model is the owner is so rich it doesn't matter. Right. And so the, the tagline Go woke, go broke. Okay, fair enough. That does end up eventually being true a lot of the time, but it matters the timeline. It matters how long on, can you be woke until you go broke, right? And that shows you that while economic incentives and economic factors do eventually win out, Cultural factors are very powerful. And what's happening with SI, yeah, SI, when the managing uh, editor of the swimsuit edition, and she's got 85,000 Instagram followers, and she goes and puts a tranny on, and an uh, overweight woman on the cover of the Sports Illustrated uh, issue, and her, uh, her comments on Instagram are all these, you know, goop uh, uh, membership subscribers talking about how amazing it is that she's being so inclusive with the, with the swimsuit edition. She's going to sit there and think that she's right, even if the numbers are going down, right? right. So there's, there's resistance to the economic economic incentives because there's such a powerful cultural incentive recently. And that is what happened with the LA Times. But like you said, your your uh, philosophy eventually wins out because apparently uh, uh, the Sun Xiang, the mother of the Sun Xiang family, Michelle Sun Xiang, she was the one most bothered by their losses. Apparently the inside baseball was that at a board meeting sometime in the last year, she lost it and was lamenting, we're writing a million dollar check a week to keep this business in, in operation. We can't do this any longer. And that, you know, Patrick Sun Xiang is probably sitting there saying, you know, okay, well, I'll lose 300, 400 million dollars. I'll still be there with about six, seven billion dollars. Nika Sun Xiang certainly doesn't care. She'd rather have this as her woke platform and amplification of her worldview. But Michelle, luckily for us, Michelle Sun Xiang uh, uh, likes to, you know, embrace reality a little bit more. And she eventually had it and said, we can't keep on losing 50 million dollars a year. Well, there's a couple moments that uh, stood out to me. And one of them is chronicled in a book that I wrote 
a couple of years back. Um, and I'll, I'll play that some audio clip because I was sort of on this uh, early with the Times or earlier with the Times. Uh, the other, the incredible headline I always like is uh, Larry Elder, who was black and <laughs> run, running for governor, was the was the black face of white supremacy and unbelievable. But here's the thing, everybody. You can look at those kinds of things isolated, or you can look at them as globally. And 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 I would look. I would ask you to look at things globally. And ladies, if you're going out on a first date and you're getting ready in the bathroom, and the guy's standing in the parlor, and your dog comes up to sniff his shin, and you see out of the corner of your eye him kick the dog. It's not just he has an issue with dogs. It's a global issue. That's not the guy you want to have kids with, right? right? And so when you are going to print that a black man is the black face of white supremacy based on nothing, uh, who grew up in South Central, by the way, Larry Elder, then um, there's an issue globally uh, on on your newsprint. Um, We have me complaining about the an op-ed thing on the LA Times which I, I think will speak to exactly what we're talking about this is uh, from uh, um, I'll be your emotional support animal from about uh, eh, three years ago I used to think news just reported the news I would look at the LA Times growing up and see a story about an accident with a minivan and two fatalities Now we veered off into this sensationalistic, emotion-driven, chick-catering news. It's no longer there was a two-car collision on Pico in Venice that left two dead. LAPD believes alcohol was a factor. Instead, we have chicks and soft dudes saying there was a car accident involving a child. A child. She loved my little pony. She'll never see her 18th birthday. She'll never vote. Ugh, shut the fuck up and spit out some facts. Speaking of the LA Times, it's a worthless rag that makes me glad I'm functionally illiterate. They had an op-ed after the Parkland shooting that made me want to go on a killing spree. Let me preface all of this with the fact that while you can yank me and you can crank me, I'm no Ted Nugent. I own guns for protection, but I'm not a gun nut. Though I once saw a documentary called Red Dawn, So I think I'm well qualified to speak about violence in schools. After the Parkland shooting, the LA Times editorial board wrote the following. We listened to the bleedings of the gun enthusiasts that, well, if those teachers had guns, then this wouldn't have been as bad. Been as bad. Think about that. If a pistol strapping chemistry teacher had grabbed her 45 and unloaded on today's gunman after he killed what? One student? Three students? Five students? That would have been good news? Of course it'd be good news, you fucking imbeciles. If you were student number six who didn't die because an adult was armed, then that would be fucking good news. Whoever wrote this is an insane person. I was the worst student in North Hollywood High. If I was a part of the LA Times editorial team, I'd have stood up in the meeting and said, Hey, fucksticks, we're shitting on our own point. In their attempt to make a case against guns, they made a very compelling argument for arming teachers. That must have been amazing in speech and debate club in high school. If this was a news story about a school bus crash instead of a school shooting, and someone was able to stop all but one kid on the bus from being killed, it'd be good news. You'd be touting that person as a hero. We get it, LA Times editorial team. You hate guns. Do I want to live in a world where armed teachers are necessary? Fuck no. But I don't want to live in a world with Kim Jong-un, the Taliban, or DJ Khaled either. (laughs) We must, as Dr. Drew has always said, accept reality on reality's terms. Even the loved ones of those killed would understand that. If you gathered all the family members of every kid who died in a school shooting and conducted the world's most uncomfortable survey asking, would you have preferred a teacher at the school be armed, all their hands would go up. How could they not? Your editorial is the opposite of sense. If that pistol-strapping chemistry teacher was a good shot, one between the Parkland shooter's eyes before he killed again, you'd be a fool not to want that. 
By pushing this agenda and stoking the fire against common sense measures, you're now partially responsible. Please write a story about yourself as an accessory to murder. If every kid who wanted to go into a school and rack up a body count thought there was someone there armed and trained, that would slow their role significantly. Don't try to convince me otherwise. They know that schools, just like movie theaters and country music concerts, are soft targets. The dipshits at the L.A. Times are hoping to keep schools soft, just like their brains. I wish we knew specifically who the author of the editorial is so we could never listen to anything they ever said again. Well, there you go, Matt. Early money on uh, what a piece of shit the Times was. A <laughs> uh, lot of bullseyes in that monologue. A <laughs> lot of bullseyes. Yeah, literally and figuratively. Yeah, though at a certain point they stop making sense, like, you know, defund the police is a sort of, you know, nonsensical. Numerous, the numerous articles they wrote celebrating trying to uh, assuage the guilt <clears throat> of those celebrating the death of the unvaccinated. There's, they, they didn't just have one of those. They had multiple. Yeah. I was reading somebody, I don't know if the times or not, but they're like, hey, if you're going to leave California, don't talk yeah. shit. And yeah. I'm like, w w why wouldn't you talk? First off, that's like you getting divorced and not talking shit about your ex. There's mm -hmm. a reason you're leaving. Well, because they know. They know it's because their worldview has turned out to be a failure. The way that they, the vision they had for this city is is uh, inspiring people to leave and they want to make themselves feel better about it or try to deflect blame. That's what they're trying to do. So what do you say? Uh, what do you think? Do you have predictions? You know, people always kind of say, well, we got to, we got to bottom out. And <laughs> I'm, I, I might. I have one answer to that was if, if you found syringes and bags of heroin in your kid's room, would you just say to your, and your wife said, let's get him into rehab. You go, wait till he flatlines. Yeah, yeah. You know, let's just wait till we see foam coming out of his mouth yeah, yeah. and him on the floor. We've already bottomed out. And then we'll hit him with the paddles. And if he comes back, Jeez. then we'll talk about <laughs> rehab. I'm like, <laughs> let's, why do we bottom? Why is everything bottom out? And then like, mm -hmm. right. Here's the deal. Um, I've lived here my whole life. We are heading toward the bottom at a rapid pace. Um, everyone's definition of bottoming out is a little bit different, but we can basically agree on on what it is. And bottoming out ma basically means people who have lived here for prolonged periods of time, who formerly loved the state, who are leaving to places they like less, but they can't tolerate this. I think that would be a state bottoming out. We're there. We're not quite on terra firma, but we're we're moments away from impact. Why not stop and change direction now? And how come we're incapable of that? You're you're correct about that. We're not quite San Francisco yet. It's not right. that bad. However, but as growing up here myself as well, um, this was the place that all of all me and my friends who grew up here. I'm sure the same with you. We lived and we grew up in the place that everybody always wanted to come to. We had to fight people off. There was nobody who was successful who could make it in this town who was leaving, right? Oh. Nobody. And when you, not you even would a, not even hear, a when you would hear as a, as a as a person who grew up in North Hollywood and who was kind of geographically illiterate, like I didn't know where anything was, you know, I didn't even know what, you know, I thought Chicago was a state, you know, it's like, if you said to me, Cleveland's in Ohio, I'd go, Cleveland, that's not Ohio, Ohio's a different place than, than Cleveland. I, I would always watch these TV shows, these game shows, and I go, right uh, to New York, New York. I'm like, why are they saying New York twice? I don't even know what that means. Like, I didn't know anything. If you would have said to me, how about moving to Tennessee? How about moving to Kentucky? I'm like, what am Nashville. I doing, running moonshine? Yeah. Are you nuts? Nashville's vacuuming up L.A. residents. That's where days. they shot B-roll for the Beverly Hillbillies. I'm not moving <laughs> there. Like, I, it, would, it, it would sound insane, much less Montana. Okay, so in terms of where we go from here, and the thing is, what you describe about which direction is it's not linear. For instance, in terms of some people waking up, Karen Bass, not our preferred winner for mayor. However, she did get one point that people were fed up with, with, the, uh, with the rate of crime and said, I'm going to put myself on the line and go get criticized by the Nika Soon Xiongs of the world to increase funding for the LAPD. Great. Karen, I do give her credit for going ahead and getting increased funding. Here's the problem. Nobody wants a job. They're waving money at people to be cops in LA. Nobody wants it. Nobody's coming to, to do that job. 
So you can try, you know, uh, will people wake up? Okay, waking up is only the first step. There's structural issues in trying to turn it around. For instance, structurally, the uh, the LA mayor's race, Los Angeles, the city, the district does not include West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, um, and a couple other districts that you know are a little more toward in our direction. And if LA City's mayor mayoral district had included those territories, maybe Rick Caruso wins. Um, so that's an issue. We're still dealing with the lingering effects of 2020. For instance, a district attorney named George Gascon, who's you know both an imbecile and a lunatic, and is far is pretty much a public defender in the district attorney's office. It's uh, one of the most disgusting, uh, most obscene uh, uh, developments in American politics ever. That after what he did to San Francisco, he comes down here and is able to pull the wool over people's eyes, ride the wave of George George Floyd, and get elected. He is up for re-election this year. Um, these elections in LA are coming up quicker. Ballots go out in a week. The 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 elect the primary is on March first. Ballots go out in a week. Um, the it's not looking good for George Gascon, which means it's looking good for us. I do have even friends that are Democratic consultants who are far more liberal than us, and they say. I don't care who he's up against. He, a Republican could beat him. Literally, we mentioned his name when we were uh, talking about endorsements in 2022. He was poison. Right. Um, but the situation with the, the two the two main elections coming up that are important for L.A. this year are district attorney and uh, uh, city council district four. The current city council person in that district is Nithya Rotman. She is a mem- car- card carrying member of the uh, Democratic Socialist. Your favorite. She, That's your favorite. She's my favorite. Woman. OK, let's she's, talk about getting rid of her because we got a shot. No, well, we got a pull the tape. We got to keep her for content. We, gotta, we keep her for <laughs> she content. Is good for content. <laughs> She's a soundbite machine. It is really unbelievable. I, I don't know her. I've never met her. I have know nothing about her background. All I know is that she's a poster child for every retarded chick think progressive idea on the planet. And when I just go, I'm not down with this kind of governing, and people go, give me one example of what you're talking about, I would go, her making this speech. Go ahead, Dawson. Instead of responding to it with work, with urgency, with focus on actually addressing the issue, we say, oh, we'll just ban it. We'll just, we'll just ban it and that'll be the end of it. Instead of actually thinking about what is gonna address this issue in a very real way. In this case, I think one of the things that really infuriates me is that we have a company, a, you know, the pre, whatever, Toyota, who makes the Prius, um, that essentially has a device on their cars, which is super easy to remove. It's basically the value of a MacBook right uh-huh. that is put in a place that is incredibly easy to access in your car and yeah. then the thefts related to this okay. issue okay catalytic been- converter okay there's never been easy access and a sawzall in the same sentence <laughs> you know what i mean like i i never said like uh i've never been like matt Oh, I got the keys to your car. I'm going to leave them in my mailbox. You can have your girlfriend drop you off and pick them up. You're going to need a cutting wheel and a sawzall. Bring some WD-40. I think there's a 210 outlet. I can run a cord for you unless you have an 18-volt or 22-volt sawzall. Bring a good carborundum blade on that wheel because I welded the mailbox shut. But anyway, it's going to be super easy. It's easy access. <laughs> Super easy access for you to pick up your spare keys. I'm just going to weld the fucking mailbox shut. Okay what I mean? So bring a Sawzall. Oh, oh, bring a floor jack. Bring a big... Okay. Matt, you might Matt. need a partner. <laughs> okay. Make sure you got a good wheel man. Okay? Does your girlfriend drive? She's pretty aggressive? She handle a stick? <laughs> Evidently she can or you want to be... All right, listen. Floor jack. Jack stands. Or you can bring blocks, four by four blocks, four by six blocks. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Just make sure, swing by, grab the keys. It's going to be welded in the mailbox. As actually, you're not going to be able to really get to the mailbox. I'm going to put the mailbox under the house. <laughs> okay. So uh, bring a creeper. You have a mechanics creeper. You have something you can slide in on. Fun one. All right. I'm going to take the mailbox. I'm going to take your keys and put them in the mailbox. I'm going to go ahead and weld the mailbox closed, and then I'm going to mount it in the middle of the house, in the bottom of the house. There's access there. It's probably 14 inches. You can (laughs) slide in there, and then all you need to do is cut away the mailbox, and you can grab those spare keys and be on your way. Sounds like a piece of cake. Easy. All right, so much like the example of the guy on the first date kicking the puppy, That's all you need to know? That's all I need to know about this crazy bitch. She's got a 10 cent head. She doesn't think about anything correctly. If this is her approach to catalytic converter thievery, which is an epidemic here, Chris will tell you. Yep. um, 
then we don't need her making any decisions on any subjects ever. And, okay, so here's the situation with her race. Um, we have a chance to get rid of her. One of the factors being she was redistrict. Her district uh, was, was shifted to cover more of Sherman Oaks, which is a territory that's going to be less receptive to her ideas than Silver Lake, which is also a lot of her district. <laughs> Silver Lake. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost, too, it's, it's still on the nose. It's, it's perfect, yeah. Um, she's running against a gentleman named Ethan Weaver, who's a great guy. He's a sensible, conscious person. We would be lucky to have him in this position. Um, prosecutor in the city's attorney's, city attorney's office. Just going to propose it right now and throw it out there. Hey, maybe he's someone that you would like to have on. I think he, getting Ethan's message and his candidacy out there would be fantastic because replacing Nithya with Ethan would be a, a meaningful step in the right direction for the city. But this is this election. The, they are there's one other person who's running. So the chances that one of Ethan or Nithya gets over fifty percent in the March election that's literally coming up in six weeks uh, is pretty high. Um, but. Because we have a good candidate, because Nithya's association with the DSA has alienated a lot of Jewish uh, followers of hers or some people. What's Jewish the DSA? Oh, uh, Adam, what are we talking here, man? Jesus. Okay. Democratic Socialists of America, the DSA. Oh, she's yeah. in that? Oh, yeah. she's oh. she's won a car. She was their first win. Their first big win, the DSA's first big win locally in Los Angeles was Nithya Rahman in 2020, okay? Yeah. And the, the Democratic Socialists of America, and this is another thing that the casual, the media, even the mid, medium information voter doesn't pay attention to, because I think there's no way that a card-carrying, like, on-the-face socialist organization would gain any, any purchase in any major city in Los Angeles, but they have. These people are truly uh, uh, affiliated with this organization, and they were well-funded for a long time. The Democratic Socialists of America had their preferred candidates, and they have you know, not just socialists, not just economic policies that govern, you know, that are part of their platform. It's also pro-Palestinian. It's also defund the police. It's every left-wing, progressive, radical, dumbass idea you could imagine. Nithya Rahman was their first win in 2020. If we bounce her, if we defeat her, that will send a message that, sorry, you're, you, you guys had some fun. Your time is over. Um, yeah. And also the Democratic Socialists of America, if you do want some other sh rays of light at, at the end of the tunnel, in addition to the L.A. Times imploding, the DSA does seem to be in some financial trouble. Um, yeah. They reported that they are going to be laying off a lot of their staff, you know, some socialists with a bunch of funding and a big staff. Um, and so, you know, we, we do have a chance to get rid of Nithya. Everybody go check out Ethan Weaver. If you live in at District 4 in, in, in Los Angeles, if you're in group chats with other residents in your neighborhood, friends, go tell everybody who to vote for. That's how this is done. I think it's important at this juncture to point out for Matt, myself, and most everyone in this, this building, which is I'm not fundamentally against a group like even even if you're a democratic socialist, I'm I'm willing to see how it plays out. You know, I'm I'm sort of, you know, I'm a quarterback's coach, and this guy throws sidearm, and it seems a little unorthodox mm -hmm. to me. But let's see him scrimmage a little bit, and if he's if he's getting some completions and he's moving the chains, then all right, let's give him a few more shots. I'm I'm not. You know, it's not the way I would train a guy to throw a ball. If I got a hold of Pop Warner football players, I wouldn't use this technique. But sometimes shit works. Yeah. And I feel that way about everything politically in Los Angeles, which is I'm not Ted Nugent. I don't have all these ideas baked in. I'm just seeing your ideas, and I heard them, and I was dubious. <laughs> like I was like defunding the police or going after Toyota for making it too easy. To, uh, for, to having access wearing too short a skirt, yeah. catalytic converters or whatever it is, okay. But some time has passed, and we've seen how it plays out. And your ideas are patently fucking horrible, <laughs> and nothing is coming out the other end. So now I'm going to say, let's go a different direction. And then they go, oh, because you don't like, you know, women of color or whatever this <laughs> group is. And it's like sidearm throwers. Yes, I, no. If if anything works, you keep on hitting the mascot. With you're, you, you're you've hitting, walked 15 batters, yeah. and you're hitting the mascot like Nuke Lelouch. I mean, it's Time crazy. For a new quarterback. Yeah. Yes. yes. And what that's that's even the craziest or varsity thing. blues. Yeah. And people might say, well, Matt, you describe. 
you seem like a Republican. Well, those aren't the candidates in L.A. that I'm supporting. I raised money and I supported Tracy Park and she was the one person who won that didn't get the L.A. Times endorsement has been doing a great job in, in District 11 in Venice, making some progress there. She's a Democrat. Ethan Weaver is a gay Democrat. Okay, oh, we're I'm not. Out. Oh yeah, I don't huh? I'm out now. Yeah, sorry. No, I'm out. no, no. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're going to bring him on, but yeah. now there's the cooties thing. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> either way, and whatever, we'll discuss that afterwards. However, these are just Democrats from LA in 2007. That's it. Yeah, that's when the it. City, that's, that's it. it. Well, Antonio Villaraigosa. Not the smartest or most ethical or greatest politician ever. But, but one thing he was not was fucking crazy. Okay. Yes. You stick an Antonio Villaraigosa in charge of the city and it runs and the natural uh, the natural resources and, and skills and abilities of this town percolate to the, at the surface and life is good. Then you replace Villaraigosa with these fucking lunatics and you see what happens. All this, we need is replacement level people. Yes. No, I completely agree. I mean, this... I don't even know what Tom Bradley was. You know, this notion of like, we need people of color. Tom Bradley was a mayor 50 years ago in this goddamn town. 50 years ago, we had a black a black mayor. And we all agreed. I, I like him. He's pretty good. He's pretty like good. He's doing, a, he's doing a normal job. Yeah. That's all, all we wanted was sort of normalness. And then you get accused of taking one side. And it's like, no, if you showed me a Democrat that said, uh, police force needs to be robust and uh, we need to have, you know, we need school choice and we need, you know, with the, the education and security and job creation and whatever. And we need to bring down the regulation a little bit. If you just made sense, then I would go fine. And uh, Vera Gosa, whose real name is Tony Villar, <laughs> who's a sociopath because he changed his name yeah, from Tony Villar, he... uh, from Vera, from Tony Villar to Vera Gosa in college. By the way, any oh. dude, I don't. If a guy goes from college. Tim to Timothy, yeah, past the age uh, after his pubes pop in, I'm not down with that dude. But this guy went a full transition, <laughs> went from Tony Villar to uh, Antonio Villaraigosa. Gave some excuse about his wife, uh, reverence to his wife who he cheated on. But okay, he gave some <laughs> bullshit excuse. But he wanted the Hispanic vote. So by, by the way, you're out when you start courting groups. You know what I mean? Um, but he did do one thing that was super. For smart. He did not try to take the bar for the fifth time. <laughs> and that's the smartest thing that guy's uh, ever done. Yeah, he <laughs> failed the bar four times, but had the wisdom and the foresight and the dignity to not try a fifth time. Inspiring. It's inspiring. Yeah, I yeah. tell my children that story all the time. <laughs> if you're gonna quit, if you're gonna lose, lose quick. Right, move on to the next thing. He realized after four attempts at passing the bar that he was so fucking stupid that he never took it for a fifth time. And again, I find that inspiring. It should be yeah. on a poster with like an eagle. Right. You know, soaring on it. How, how he doesn't have a self-improvement podcast at this point. I mean, Tony Villar, we need to know his secrets. His, you know, we need we need his morning routine, what oh, breath yeah. work he does. Yeah. We need the whole show. Oh, he and does the, Wim Hof. He's Wim Hof. Huge Wim Hof. All guy. the Wim Hof, cold dunks, <laughs> the whole thing. He's got the infrared sauna. And we won't even go into how he booted my friend and my brother out of a table at a nightclub in 2009. That's oh. another story altogether. <laughs> we got to make sure, make sure... Antonio Villaraigosa failed the bar four times. I don't want to besmirch his good dumb name. <laughs> and didn't pass a fifth time. But by the way, that's not on him. That's us. We voted in a guy to run the seventh largest economy in the world who failed the bar. Four times. Four times. But not a fifth. You're an attorney. I've passed the bar. I hadn't slept in three days. It's not that hard. Well, it's stressful, but it's not that hard. Mm. If you do the work, you pass. Yeah. Four failures. At the bar. But by the way, you know where all these guys, the thing that I always say with all these guys, the same thing I say about Don Lemon, which is, what are they up to now? You know what I mean? Like, what's Tony, the guy was the mayor for eight years, I guess, felt like 28 in Los Angeles. He does nothing now. Now, what happens is the local college or university will throw these retards a bone just to go, oh, we got Brian Stilter on our staff or whatever. <laughs> that doesn't mean they belong there. Um, between him and Garcetti, the guys ran Los Angeles. Both will never hear from again. It's not that they're I'm, starting businesses or doing anything. No After really, failing four times, he became a field representative with the United States teachers. Los, United States, he became a union guy. 
Well, after failing four times. Viragosa, not n- people didn't really expect much out of, but people had real expectations for Garcetti. I mean, Garcetti's fall from grace is pretty astonishing. I mean, just uh, yeah. uh, just uh, completely shamed and, and, you know, robbed of any dignity, like being hung out to dry for an ambassadorship in India. Oh, did he get approved for that? I don't think so. Yeah. Yes, he did. Oh, he, did he get approved? He got approved Let me double check. After, after okay. about yeah. 18 months. A but bunch he of people sh- finally caved. Yeah, I think so. He, this guy shuffled out to India. His political career is over. This was just a yeah. Safe, a safe facing uh, a face saving move um and but listen let's go to via ragosa hey let's give him a little credit because when people asked him about the cops in 2009 he says i love the cops charlie beck's doing an amazing job and when the cops busted some you know some uh, scumbag's head who was resisting arrest he didn't step in and say oh my god i cannot believe I, i'm outraged by the the actions of this police officer no he supported law enforcement and at least he was you know at least he was championing you know public safety and and kind of respecting the desire of people in the city to live in a safe city at least he did that yeah well, he was back when people were normal. Yeah. And there was a difference between right and left, but the left was still normal. Now the yeah. left is batshit crazy, and they're filled with, everyone hates me when I say chick think, but these are chick think ideas. These are sort of weird, fantastical. <laughs> Look, chick think is we should be angry at Toyota for welding a <laughs> catalytic converter in the center of their car. Um, that's that's crazed. And... And then that will lead to death and destruction and people fleeing. So you're, you're gonna ha- we're going to have to figure out a way to remedy that. After two years, Garcetti became ambassador to India. So he is. Dawson's right. He, is, he made it into uh, India and uh, good rinse. He was horrible. Huh. And it's really what, what the thing about L.A. that I realize that we suffer from is hubris. We go, we're California, we're LA, you know, we're the tip of the spear. All the ideas that are different, they start here and then they spread out around the land. And that's true when it comes to like bell bottom jeans, (laughs) if this was 1969, you know what I mean? But these are horrible uh, policy ideas and everywhere they go, such as places in Minnesota, which is turned to shit bizarrely, to me, you know, Paul Bunyan and Bud Grant, that's how I grew up with Minnesota. Right next to a big Somali community that just got implemented. Oh, implement, yeah. Right. Asserted. right. So now Minnesota's fucked. Or you can go San Francisco or you can go, you know, parts of New York and New York and stuff like that. Anywhere these ideas get implemented, they fail. So let's learn from that and, and go another direction. But we, we have so much hubris that we won't do it. There's no. There's definitely a uh, hot chick who never thought she had to exercise uh, characteristic to California and Los Angeles. Right. And or read a book. Yeah. And, and a little bit of that <clears throat> is because we've had a hundred years of building up the the aggregate impact of building infrastructure and human capital and these great universities and all this wealth and Silicon Valley and, you know, Hollywood and the amount of, uh, of talent that that attracted. And once you've got, have a, a hundred decades of building that up, it gets tougher to screw up. So you get a little cocky, but then when you, you wake up after seven to 12 years or some period of time, when the policies and the way that it's been run are, are, you know, are chipping away at that, it is tougher to turn around. Um, and people kind of, you know, some people want to go double down and say, Hey, it's not happening. A lot of people People, and this was what I was ranting about eight years ago when I started to notice this stuff. People said, ah, oh, the pendulum will swing. Listen, hear me on this. Pendulums don't swing naturally. They only swing if you push them, okay? All these idiots like Nithya Rachman or Nick Asuncheong and all, the cultural power that they assumed over the past 10 years, they're not going to give it up without a fight. They're not just going to let the pendulum swing. You have to take the power back from them. And, you know, there's a variety of ways to do that. Obviously, at the ballot box, we can do it. You know, like I said, 2024, the uh, city council district four race and the district attorney are the two places to do that. Um, on the district attorney's race, it's a little it's a little more cloudy because it, it almost there's like 11 people running against George Gascon in the primary. It's unlikely anyone will get 50 percent. So that probably goes to a runoff. Keep track of that race. Whoever's name, wh- whichever candidate's name is not George Gascon, yeah. vote for them. <laughs> My preferred candidate's a guy named John McKinney. I think he's great, but there's also guys like Nathan Hawkman, Eric Sedell, um, uh, yeah. and uh, Jonathan Hitami, who were fantastic. But at this point, as you said, which is a very different and interesting, and did we ever play that clip of the Minnesota all female oh, yeah. city council? All right, we'll cue that one up because it'll underline my point about Minnesota going nuts. And news going nuts and chick think and everything taking a shit. 
Um, you brought up Gascon. Um, so I, I'll tell you a very sad and but 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 sort of revealing um, place we're at. You know, you then then say our DA George Gascon. It's Gascon, right? Gascon. Gascon. George Gascon. You just said it. Anybody but him. It Correct. doesn't matter. Which yes. which is a very weird place to live, you know, <laughs> and and I always say that about Los Angeles. You grew up here, I grew up here. You you'll never meet a person who left formally. Once in a while, somebody's dad's job relocated somewhere and they had to leave. Yes. You know what I mean? And then once in a while there was a we got a condo in Maui and we're just cashing in and we're going to put our feet in the sand and drink Coronas every day at noon, you know, and you go, oh, okay. So they're very rare exceptions, but they were usually motivated by something and occasionally to a place that was better than, than California. Now I talk to a lot of people. I go, you leave in California? They go, yeah. I go, where are you going? I go, I don't know. Anywhere. <laughs> yep. they, they go, maybe Nevada, Tennessee, I don't know, Florida. You're kind of like that right Texas, now. <laughs> that's how I yeah. am. And it's like, that's a shit sign. Because yeah. that's not me going, my business moved to Austin. And that's not me going, my grandkids are in Florida and I want to be close. That's me just going, I'm just leaving. The and quality that, of life is better somebody, somewhere else. Right. We were never in a position where there was a better, an, uh, uh, the someone else had a better deal, was offering a better deal on day-to-day quality of life than we had. That's right. Never. Now, again, you can go, you go to Montana or you can go to Florida. doesn't matter. All right. I have this great clip that somebody tweeted me. And um, it's Chick Think um, of the highest order. It's, it's an evening news. I think it's a CBS evening news. I think you'll like this story. History was made in Minnesota's capital city of St. Paul today. Or should we say, herstory was made. (laughs) St. Paul's new city council was sworn in this afternoon, made up entirely of women. And get this, six of the seven council members are women of color, Mm. and they are all under the age of 40. Four of them are new members Mm. and say that affordable housing and access to child care are some of their top priorities. Congratulations to them and the people of St. Paul. I am betting that they get some stuff done. <gasps> oh. Oh. <laughs> it's grotesque. Oh, oh my it's god! It's grotesque. By the way, Wait, that wasn't the Babylon Bee. <laughs> it wasn't the Babylon Bee. That's you know, it's a couple of weeks ago yeah. on the that piece e- is called Breaking Barriers. The national should be called Breaking Wind. That's national. <laughs> that's a CBS <laughs> national news. Okay, <clears throat> Let, please, everyone. Few things. First off, get some fucking writers. Herstory. And the second thing where it's like, I'm sure they're going to get stuff done. Based on what? Based on what gaggle of women of color under the age of 40 out just fucking well, kicking ass? In, Are you in, nuts? In their defense, isn't this the sidearm thrower? We've never had this yeah. before. Yeah, Maybe see. a screwballer, like, I don't know, a spitballer. It's been a while since we had a spitballer. People of St. Paul, start packing Let's your rucksacks, man. <laughs> you know, your, your family moved here from Sweden in 1847. You're I think out. it's time. Yeah, that, those time days are Pack it in. Okay, so first off, this um, uh, pandering, this sort of grotesque sort of, whether it's women or whether it's women under 40 or with women of color, this bizarre grotesque pandering that we do, you know, that we're now at the point where it's like you have to see the Academy Awards and like, I'm the 14th man of color to win cinematography. It's like, okay, just stop. Just stop. Just do a good fucking job. Nobody cares what color you are, you fucking retards. And what are we basing this on? Like Lori Lightfoot or London Breed or Kamala Harris? Like, what What, what are the chips of color? They're just fucking destroying it. Like, I get certain things. Like, maybe when you're uh, recruiting for Brigham Young, you might be looking for a Samoan nose tackle. You know what I mean? Because you go, fucking chemo over there. He's He's... 375 stepping out of the sauna. That's even before. That's his driveway. You know what I mean? Like, I get certain... I get if you want protection, you want a Doberman Pinscher or German Shepherd. Like, I get there's certain things for certain places. I have no 
There's no indication to me that young women of color kick ass in the governing department. Also, it's pandering and weird and sort of exclusionary and and, and borderline racist where you're going, here's who they are. Oh, and guess what, everybody? Guess what? Five of them are black or something other than you. It's just the lowest form of, of humanity and like it's just so cringe and juvenile to put that at the at the forefront of how you talk about people and how you view life. Right? And you and bet they're going to get something done yeah, about those ladies. But here's the other thing. We yeah. made a ton of progress in the advancement of females and you know people in minority groups in professional spaces and government and whatnot from the late 60s through the early 2000s. It didn't have any of this shit. You right. didn't have this strange obsession with identity. We just accepted, hey, we had a society that might have had some, some barriers and some blind spots about letting some of the skills of some of these people shine based on their characteristics. Okay, we we created taboos that you shouldn't discriminate against people like for on those characteristics. You should look at merit and character and things got a lot better and these people in these groups made lots of advancements and then sometime around roughly 2012 to 2014 everyone said you know something let's make this as cringe as possible yeah let's put this let's dump cringe fuel on this thing and make it no not just that these people have made advances and we should try to be colorblind and live by the mlk content or content of your character over the color of your skin whatnot it's like let's make people's uh, uh let's make everything of a demographic spreadsheet and just talk about that constantly in this obsession no healthy society has an obsession session with people's uh, mutable characteristics or skin color or gender like this. It's insane. I want to hear it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. I love her story. It's it her story. Made. Yeah. I think you'll like this story. History uh, was made in Minnesota's capital city of St. Paul today. Or should we say her story was made? St. <laughs> Paul's new city council was sworn in this afternoon, made up entirely of women. And get this, six of the seven council members are women of color, and they are all under the age of 40. Four of them are new members and say that affordable housing and access to child care are some of their top priorities. Congratulations to them and the people of St. Paul. I am betting that they get some stuff done. Super condescending white yeah. cunt. All right. <laughs> Can we do this then? Let's be fair. Uh, let's, I mean, let's be scientific about this. I just want to be clear. I want things to be fair and equitable. Um, you have women under 40, six of them of color, all female. And you know that that in part is what's going to propel them to get a lot of stuff done in St. Paul. So now we can do an experiment because we don't have a bunch of white dudes mucking up the experiment. We just have <laughs> women of color under 40, of young women of color. If St. Paul turns to shit in the next five years, which it inevitably will, <laughs> can we then announce that young women and women of color are shitty at running things? Because you made the proclamation that they're good at running stuff based on their color and based on their age. That's what, what was implied. So then I, if they turn to shit, then I can draw the conclusion that those people are bad at running shit. Would that be a fair uh, trade? Adam, or you want to go down this road? Because that's the road. You're just way that's off the road we're going trying down. to even, you know, uh, trying to even consider actual results. Come on, that's You're not right. what we're in the business of. We're mm -hmm. in the business of engineering, you know, engineering positions based on skin color and and gender and whatnot. We're not into results You're or right. quality of life. You're that's right. not what we're doing here. We got Kamala Harris to thank. <laughs> All right, we got some news. We'll take a break. Matt's going to hang out, and we'll do that right after this. Let me tell you about Simply Safe 2023. Well, that's wrapped. Time to reflect. This year, resolve to keep your loved ones safer than ever with the best home security system of 2023. According to U.S. News and World Report, Simply Safe. That's right. We all use it here. It's compact, it's ergonomic, batteries last up to 10 years. Comprehensive, by the way, detects break-ins, fires, floods, and other threats. 24-7 professional monitoring, under a buck a day, half the cost of traditional home security, satisfaction guaranteed. 60 days, risk-free trial. If you don't love it, you can return the system for a full refund. And my listeners, save 20% on a new system with fast protect monitoring at simplysafe.com slash Adam. That is simplysafe.com slash Adam. There's no safe like Simply Safe. In honor of Jim Carolla's 92nd birthday, here's a list of all the things Adam Carolla will do before he dies. 
direct a movie called Awesome so that entertainment shows will have to refer to him as Awesome Director Adam Carolla. Then follow it up with the sequel, Hung Like a Rhino. Just one of the things Adam will do before he dies. Let's get back to the Adam Carolla Show. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Make a movie called Awesome. All right. What do we got? Well, I want to bring back to the LA Times real quick just because we have Matt here. Mm -hmm. So these these layoffs, um, just like conspiracy theory predictions, uh, is this going to be like the great reawakening? Are they restructuring for something that you actually want? Or are they just going to continue making <laughs> bad decisions? Like, what are we, what do we predict is going to happen? Because, it, because from what I'm seeing, Patrick Soon Shiong is the one who's doing all the commenting, making all the statements. Is he taking it back from Nika? Like, what? Well, based on what's been uh, published the last few days, no, they published their endorsement of George Gascon, one of the most vile pieces of journalism I've ever seen in my right. life. I mean, just completely de- devoid of any reality whatsoever about how he did such a good job and how he's, um, uh, you know, he, he made promises that people supported and he's implementing those and they've served the people of Los Angeles, completely psychotic. Uh, Patrick Soon Xiong, he's shown so far he doesn't have the courage or the manhood to go ahead and do this and do the right thing. He's not going to do that. There's no chance. The only chance that the LA times turns around is if it gets so painful for him and it is getting very painful and i can tell you i'll tell you why i know a little bit more inside baseball in just a second um it might get to the point where he cries uncle and sells it um not that i've and not that I'm criticizing Rick Caruso or that I, I have told him directly this, but um, Rick Caruso spent a lot of money running for mayor. If he wants to be, if he wants his most highest ROI uh, function or activity, go convince, go buy this puppy off Patrick and turn That'd it into something sensible. Yeah, um, you know, and I plan on delivering that message to some of his people. Um, no, the best case scenario, realistically, with Sun Xiang and this restructuring, is not that the LA Times becomes a respectable publication again. It's that it's now so shamed and now is is held in such low standard and light that the impact that it has recently had, even when it's not considered, it's not really a highly uh, circulated newspaper, but still has the power of the endorsement that more people just ignore it. There could be after this, because like I said, most people don't pay attention. Most people don't realize that the LA Times sucks. This might, this is the type of story that makes headlines, that gets people's attention, might make them realize that, oh, this paper is not worth listening to This could be like Harvard... Or a uh, little bit pen or MIT that people don't pay attention, but then you get onto the radar and Cur- that becomes yes. the beginning of the end. Right. I don't have any faith in anybody with bad ideas uh, reconsidering their ideas. Um, okay. Everybody I've known with bad ideas has ridden those bad ideas into the grave. And I kind of got, I did my experiment with COVID because uh, I shouted about everything. Uh, COVID all the time. Everyone shouted at me that I was, you know, baby killer and I hated grandpa and uh, I hated kids and people of color and they attacked me. And then I turned out to be right about everything and I've not heard any apologies. So uh, the uh, people, especially hard left people, they do not have a way to change course. And I don't know why it's baked in. I think it's because they're lying. I think it's because When you're doing something earnestly and you mean it and then you're incorrect, you will be quick to correct yourself. But if you're lying, you won't correct yourself because you know psychologically that you were lying and that the correction is admittance of your lying. So everyone I've known that's just been organically and legitimately and mistakenly off about something immediately comes back and corrects. But the people you argue with, who are basically lying, never correct themselves because that's an admittance of lying. Uh, You know, I got to be honest, I think you're giving them too much credit because I don't think they're lying. I think they're really this dumb. (laughs) All right. Yeah. And they're really this dumb. But the reason that they dig their heels in so deeply is because they're motivated by the idea that they're the good guys. Yeah. I'm telling you, more powerful than drugs, more powerful than gambling, more powerful than money. The idea that you are on the right side, that you are the compassionate, savvy, uh, uh, morally morally righteous one is more powerful than anything people underestimate it, and that's why they dig their heels I in. I totally agree with that, but when Rochelle Walensky is talking about reopening schools and then backtracking after the school unions get to her and tell her, shut up, bitch, and go up there on that podium and say, we shouldn't open schools, she's not a dumb person, and she's clearly lying. At, at, 
at that point. And when Dr. Fauci has no thoughts about Black Lives Matter rallies when he's shutting down <laughs> churches and ballparks, uh, he's not dumb and he is lying. And when Joe Biden says, I've never spoke to my son about business ever or anyone in my family about any of their business, he's lying. Like there is sure, but you're there describing, is a fair bit of lying going you're, you're, you're on out descri- there. You're describing public servants, public figures, right? That's yeah. that's it, kind of threaded into their professional life and and everything about their life. I'm talking more so, but the people on a day to day basis oh, that you might shooting find the tweets, the people who the people who are the reason that a Joe Biden or a Karen Bass or a Nithya Rahman are in office, like they think they're the good guys. Oh, they, oh, they definitely yeah. not, not even it, it it transcends good. They think they're righteous. Yes, it's further than good. Absolutely. All yeah. Right, so. What about the New York Times, though? Because the New York Times seems like it's kind of going going the other way, right? Well, the New York Times hit its nadir or something when they had that Tom Cotton op-ed yeah. about <laughs> calling out the National Guard, God forbid, when Seattle was burning for the 26th so night in a row. Pillaged. <laughs> <laughs> being, right. Police stations are being taken over. We've established a no-crime zone called CHOP. Where the police are not welcome in Ooh, Portland. The autonomous zone. Everyone the forgets about that zone. one. Right. And he had the temerity to suggest maybe the National Guard should get involved and put an end to this. Right. And the editor that let that op-ed run was run out. So, Did you see his piece in The Economist just lighting the, the New York Times on fire? It's very good. Oh, wow. No, oh, no. He, he went. It, oh, I think I did hear about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. Um, one of the few pieces that The Economist has put in front of the paywall. And he said in a maybe more you know cerebral manner, more journalistic manner, a lot of stuff that we've discussed here today about the deterioration of the world of journalism, of, ha- of why and how these uh, outlets that, you know, everyone counts on these these outlets to make sense. Like these are sense making institutions. You have to trust them why they're no longer trustworthy, why they do not perpetuate, you know, interesting or good ideas. Um, and the factors that gave rise to that and his experiences, it's it was, you know, not the way that I would have phrased it, but uh, very much, I think, a, a uh, insightful explanation of what's gone wrong with journalism over the last decade. All right. So All right. New York Times. Yeah, I don't I don't know if they're trying to correct course or not. They've got a little bit of I because. think they they realized it was going to hurt the bottom line. Yeah. Right. Same thing with Sun Xiang recently. Right. Yeah. Uh, it got that bad. So they're not as they're the New York Times is not as bad as it was 2017 to 2021. I don't think so. Um, but it's still far worse than it should be. And we're going to have to see it's going to be fascinating in the next couple of years or maybe the next five or six years to see how the New York Times deals with Trump the sequel. Right, that would be interesting. Yeah, first, yeah. Trump round one. I mean, they lost their freaking minds. The shit that was coming out of the New York Times <laughs> starting about early 2016 through 2021, I was like, I couldn't fucking believe it. Um, they've set, you know, that some of the, the temperature has gone down a little bit. You know, the 20% of the journalists there that aren't insane, they've seemed to be elevating more and, and they're not printing some. They got rid of Taylor Lorenz. They got rid of a couple of these other people. Um is the New York Times going to just go complete Babylon B level parody nutso trying to go after Donald Trump on round two? That's going to be interesting to see. Well, they weren't so far off. They got Pulitzer Prizes for the whole uh, Russia oh, yes. collusion thing. Super so. meaningful uh, credentials <laughs> yeah. in this day They were awarded Pulitzer yeah. Prizes for being wrong about a story for three years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I don't know. Now, since you brought up Trump, I, that, that Biden clip at the women's rally... I, I'm, yeah. I'm in love with that. Somebody, oh, wait, wait, who, who, Dave Rubin uh, tweeted this one. I don't know if you've seen this one, Matt. It's really, it's, uh, it's not a good thing, but I'll, we'll play it for you. We'll teach Donald Trump an, a valuable lesson. Don't mess with the men in America unless you want to get the benefit. Dear God. Yeah, sounds like. When we do one of those live podcasts at the whiskey tasting <laughs> convention, <laughs> yeah, <Being Dawson. laughs> about hour, about hour or two. Jesus so Christ! The Ace yeah, I, I don't know that he's going to be capable of going. I, I well, don't. That's the plan. You, they're they're locking him away. Is there any way I can make one phone scoot. call if you want want to keep me? Or is it, yeah, can I make one phone call? I'll be yeah. back. Yeah, I, go ahead. don't mess with women unless you want to get the benefits. Right? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that's that's essentially what he said, which makes no sense. But there's a lot of slurring 
in that whole thing. He's been at Whiskey X for a long time. Now. <laughs> it sounds like you want to say women and America at the same time. Oh, I so, thought it was women in America. Women in America. Yeah. So, so don't yeah. mess with women, women in, in America, America unless, unless you, you want, want the benefits. Unless you want to get the benefits. Let's listen again. All right. Don't mess with women in America unless you want to get the benefits. So it doesn't make sense, and it's not good. Because I want to get the benefits. I, I, like I the love benefits. benefits. I mean, that's why you mess with women in America. So to get the I benefits. think I'm going to start messing with women right. in America. Um, now, everyone says, why are all the women behind him cheering? And the answer is they can read the teleprompter right. mixed with his cadence. They're just, oh. a, they're just a crowd of dumb, unemployable. Well, we need to find these well, women because I need to know what that teleprompter yeah, said. They are the too. only ones that know. Does does somebody is there some transcript? Oh poor, poor sign language. There's a guy. lot of good ones on Twitter <laughs> that just say Shannon is going to be right. No, but I don't see a transcript. Main attempt. Yeah, when we were doing uh, Adam and Drew earlier. I was trying to find a transcript, and it kept saying inaudible, inaudible. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I don't think he's going to debate Trump. I'll just no. I'll put that out there. Early. That's the plan. Oh. Right. He he will refuse to debate. But he's not going to say, I won't debate Trump because I can't form a sentence. He's going to say, I don't debate Hitlerian dictators. Exactly. He's going he's to abstain to defend democracy. I would argue if you really hate Hitlerian dictators, you should go whoop up on them in a debate and take them down. Give that's, him a live mic. That's right. Let him say some things <laughs> well, and call him out on it. Bill O'Reilly's on your side hmm. because he says the only Democrat who could beat Trump is... Michelle Obama. Yeah. I, you know, first, okay. Are there any crazy ideas anymore? I say nay. <laughs> nay. I say every, I, every crazy idea is on the table for me. Yeah. Um, I think there, there are plenty of discussions about Barack Obama spending a lot of time in D.C. and hanging around and pulling some strings and shoehorning some policy. So, you know, what is Biden's policy? I don't know. How much of it is Biden's? How much of it is wink, wink, nudge, nudge Obama policy? Uh, he seems to have an interest. And in, in he's, not, he's not just going off into the sunset. He, he right. wants some interest. He has some interest in shaping our society. Remember, hope and change. And remember, we were four days away from fundamentally changing this society. That was his thing. He wanted to fundamentally change it. Uh, I don't think he captured that dream. But if he got his wife in there, obviously right. he can't do a third term. But there's nothing in the Constitution about laying in bed every night with the person who is doing their first term and you telling yeah. them what you want them to do. I've heard sure, it's not terms. unprecedented in politics. This it has happened it many, has? many times. Many times. Uh, there's some famous, uh, famous uh, Alabama governor, I believe, who ran his wife, Lurleen, in his mm. stead, and she won in a landslide because he was still running the show. Oh, okay. Um, I'll have to I'll have to look and, and see who that was. But for people who this sounds like a crazy conspiracy theory, um, too, just take a look at that man who just spoke about the blah, 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 the women, and tell me that you one hundred percent believe that that dude, that man is running this country. Well, tell me he's doing it. Uh, here's here's what we can here's what we can agree on. I think, I think that. The Democrats will do anything not to get Trump elected. So if we, if our, our jumping off point, Matt's back in studio. I'm sorry, it was uh, George Wallace's wife. George oh, okay. Wallace ran his wife, Lurleen. Um, Democrats are with the anyone but him mentality, right? That we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, well, with. we're talking about the feasibility of Michelle Obama parachuting in in the last moment. Zero would be a high estimate. You say zero. I say <laughs> I say everything's on the table. No, only she, because it, of what I've seen over the last few years. People overestimate in interpreting Barack Obama. They they still think like there's some mystery to him. Barack Obama's a pretty simple guy. Like he, you know, and that was for both the things I liked about him and the things I didn't like about him. He'll admit many times Michelle hated him being president. 
other than yes. the power. He kept on talking about how, uh, in, in, even in terms of, everyone, uh, oh, Barack Obama's operating the levers of power behind the scenes the entire, no, he's not. He's sitting there in his $18 million house smoking weed and enjoying his money, okay? He doesn't want to get involved. He's one of, like, other than George W. Bush, who just, like, left the public sphere entirely, and it's like, uh, uh, he men in black, like, zapped everyone's memory that he even existed, <laughs> right? Because he, he, he left with such shame. Realizing. Barack Obama's just there enjoying his money he's not involved and his wife didn't like him being there in the spotlight and all the stress that he dealt with like she doesn't want that well, and also also she's not popular hold okay on, hold we'll on yeah we have the clip of uh marvels in the mouth again with uh obama and biden did we play that one on this show or something we played show? it on the show before but you yeah they got him standing there he's he's there matt he showed up yeah, every once in a while, he's going to be there. He's the ex-president. He'll <laughs> he pop in. smoking weed in Maui. He came, yeah, a handful of times over the course of three, what four Matt's years. What Matt's saying is, is he's wearing a jacket and tie, but he probably has board shorts on and flip-flops <laughs> underneath that. Is that what you're saying, Matt? It's not it's out of bad. the question, but hey, over the course of three to four years, he's going to put on a suit and go do an appearance here and there for people. That's like uh, of the last 1,000 days or however many since he was left office, how many of those have been spent actively on political items? I guarantee you was not 10%. I gar I, I'm with you that she would not want to be president. I've heard that heard that many many times you think kamala's letting her get leapfrogged same thing with the newsom thing <clears throat> everyone do you think there's any reality in possible where they're going with the democratic party in 2024 is going to leapfrog kamala to go put gavin newsom in there every kamala ite is going to lose their mind yeah i'm just wondering what they're going to do i'm, I'm with, with you on that with biden I'm with you on they will make some attempt that we can't necessarily anticipate right now to stop trump but I don't think, and I wasn't at the same place about a year ago because they were they went all out in 2020. They pulled out all the stops to to make sure Trump didn't get in there. I thought they were going to do the same thing with trying to prosecute him. But now I'm looking at it. I I, I was wrong. They're not going to get any of these trials before the election. They can't do it. So without that, I'm wondering. Okay, what's their next tactic? I don't necessarily know. Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> no, Joe Biden's going to be the nominee. All right, I'll He's put having money on trouble. It. All right, next story. All right, so you were talking about how uh, when Trevor Noah won the Emmy, mm -hmm. uh, nobody really watches The Daily Show anymore. You, like, you don't really watch it. Well, you might want to start watching it now because they have finally found a new host. Oh, yeah. Mike oh, really? Tell me this. Yeah. Okay, who was it? It is Jon Stewart. <laughs> yeah. He's the, just doing Mondays. Yeah, so he's going to return oh, in a God. limited capacity as host on Monday nights, and then uh, correspondents will handle the rest of the week's broadcasts. Uh, this this return to the show comes after Noah's exit prompted a long search for a new host. Mm -hmm. Hassan Minaj was actually the front runner until that profiler that profile in the New Yorker came out. Oh, really? About his uh, stand up having embellished anecdotes about racism in this country. Yeah, fucking making yeah. it a worse place to live. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so he was. Yeah, he was in the running, but now uh, John Stewart is back, and I will be tuning in. <laughs> well, what what they do is what what. Biden did with Kamala Harris, which is you make this proclamation. They don't really make the proclamation, but the black guy's leaving and we're going to replace him with a person of color or a woman or a woman of color or somebody has some. Inter Someone from Minnesota's new council. Yeah, that's right. We need some intersectional bona fides, right? Under 40, for sure. Once you do that, you, the pool shrinks. The pool gets much smaller, much faster, and then you have difficulty. Like the reason we have Kamala Harris is because they announce it's going to be a female. Oh, oh, shrink it down. Oh, it's going to be a female of color. Oh, it just got smaller. And lo and behold, we have an imbecile. If you'd open it up to gingers with a cock and balls, then if you just open up to every possible candidate, then you'd have a, a better outcome and you probably would have found somebody who would have fulfilled your requirements, but you shrunk it down, and now we're having difficulty. They shrink it down even further because it's not just they fit the, demo the demographic oh, boxes. Oh, yeah, Candace Owens is off the yeah, <laughs> She's but even, out. Forget Candace Owens, someone who's even more in the middle, Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard is a woman of color and is like a left pinky is smarter than any of these people <laughs> that we're discussing. Right. I mean, by far, um, the, the perfect example with the Harvard Isn't it Gabbard? 
Gabbard. I'm yes, right, going to fuck that up. Anyway. All right. Um, situation with Harvard. Claudine Gay. There were other African-Americans who got there's one of the African-American professors that she punished was a guy named Roland Fryer. Mm-hmm. Roland Fryer's academic record was like exponentially more significant than Claudine Gay's. Roland Fryer wasn't a big DEI uh, evangelist. Right. Right. So it's not just that they need to fit the demographics. They also have to be super DEI. OK, no, you bring up a very valid point. It's it's not enough just to be black or be female or be gay because Dave Rubin wouldn't get the gig. No, you have to ideologically agree with all of their insanity. And now you've really shrunk that pool. And so that what you end up with is not racism. great candidates. Yes, it is. It is racism. What it's did not Roland, diversity. It's racism. What did Roland Fryer do? Say something like um I think he got accused. Well, one, his scholarship showed his scholarship. This is African American male professor at Harvard. Scholarship showed that there was no police bias in police. Oh, shootings. that was the problem. Yeah, but that's, that's a <laughs> big love, no-no. I love when you deliver accurate data to them, and they go, "Okay, this guy, we got a yeah. deep six. Got to get rid of this guy. He's got to be gone. He's got to be silenced." Yeah, so when the flimsiest uh, imaginable sexual harassment accusations were made against him, of course, uh, everyone right. believed all women, particularly this woman, and Roland Fryer had to, Fryer, uh, Fryer had to go. It's so nauseating. It's insane. <laughs> it's insane, and it's anti-American, and it should be nauseating to people. And that's the part that scares me. Like right before my mom died, I was like, "Oh, you got you, Larry Elder or Gavin Newsom?" He's like, "I don't know who Larry Elder is. I know Gavin Newsom. I'm going Gavin Newsom." Mm. And I'm like, Ugh. "You just can't. You just ne- never." Not, I've nothing. been pulling my hair. I, I've been pulling my hair out for eight, nine years now. And yes, and, and, and incrementally, waves of people now. I get to give I told you so and that's gratifying in a number of different directions but I mean like I even I had to got got into it with some friends the you know a couple of weeks ago not you know that hostile but I said you should be as crazy about this as I am like <laughs> you know you agree with everything I say and but you take a different posture towards it because you don't want to deal with the you don't want to deal with the smoke and I said no I'm not crazy you not being crazy is what's crazy had right. you been at had you had the same stance on this as I did in 2018, we could have cut a lot of this stuff off uh, at the head. We could have prevented a lot of it. But now we have a, a much tougher battle ahead to reverse all this stuff. And yeah, the fact that you don't look at these things and think, what planet are we on? This is insane. That's a pro- that's your you, that's your problem. You should be thinking this is that insane. Look, it's everyone's fault but mine. Yeah, I've no, said it a million times. If anything's true, the, that's it. The day they closed the beaches is the day we all should have just went to the beach. <laughs> and and I was happy to do it, and nobody would join me. And that's what fucked us. Preferred pronouns. <clears throat> Go tell no. a liberal from 2010, right. not 2000, not 1994. <clears throat> right. Go tell a, a liberal Democratic voter 2010 about preferred pronouns. They look at you like you're an alien. Like, what the you fuck? probably go what? 2015. Even, but it was starting to creep in. Then I was 2014, 15, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'd see, see kind of more, slightly more liberal than me, uh, people just uh, supporting the most insane ideas those that are, are imaginable. Those are going away, though, right? I don't yes. think I've really. Been I don't them. know, buddy. They're, they're, I, they're sliding. Uh, uh, well, look, shit that has zero utility starts to slough off. It. Uh, I'm not saying it slides off overnight. It just kind of sloughs off. The stuff that they claim is important, like voter ID. What happened to all the voter ID talk? Where Democratic friends, remember that was a major core issue for you was voter ID. I don't hear you bring it up anymore. What about uh, banning books in Florida? What about the rewriting of the history with slavery? Like, what about all these preferred pronouns? Shit you never cared about, pretended you cared about a lot, and have immediately forgotten about? Right. It means you never cared about it in the first place, because why aren't you talking about this thing? They're black people out there who don't have IDs. Get the ID mobile fired up and bring it to the inner city. Let's get these people IDs. I never hear a fucking word because you never cared about it in the first place. They never gave a shit about pronouns. That was all about compliance. They were seeing, hey, buddy, I'm going to need you to lay on the ground, kick your legs over your head, and suck your own cock for me. And then you went, what the fuck? I'm not doing that. You want to get fired? Yeah. And he went, all right, can you help me with my belt? And that's what those (laughs) fucking pussies did. That's That's what they all did. I, I Listen, everyone should have went, fuck you. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what a pronoun is. Fuck right off. I'm not giving you my pronouns. It's not interesting. My kids go to a school 
Their team name is the Spartans. The Spartans, the world's deadliest fight, fighting force. And when, when the principal writes you a letter, he has his pronouns under it. Yeah. I represent the Spartans. He, me, it. Oh, Adam, I get emails from the stuffiest law firms on the face of the planet. Dude, everybody, you can't, you know, your tie's out of place. You get fired. They got pronouns and bio. Uh, it is bonkers, right. man. And what you mentioned about Douglas Murray said, put it well. He said, the gender thing is that important to them because if they can convince you of something that crazy, they can convince you of anything. Yes, that's why the, you know, birthing people <gasps> and chest feeders and shit like that. Yeah, it's all, look, if we can convince people that uh, hippos can fly, then we can certainly pass along some other green agenda that they'll go along with where they don't want to do the fucking science on. Yeah, that's that's the plan. All of it should have been rejected from Jump Street. Right. All right, Max Banner. All right, so Boeing. Boeing. Yeah, they're... Uh there's a lot of stories coming out about them. Uh, one, you know, that door that blew off that mm -hmm. that jet. And then uh, there's another report that uh, the Alaska Airlines CEO said that they found many loose bolts mm -hmm. on some of their 737s, like nine planes, mm -hmm. uh, er earlier this month. And now another story just came out. A Boeing passenger's uh, jet's nose wheel just fell off before takeoff. Oh, great. I'm going to be on one later I today. know. Sorry, I, maybe awesome. this isn't the best story maybe <laughs> on a day you're flying, mm -hmm. but these planes are falling apart. Terrorist alert in Vegas. So Boeing's declined to comment. They're like, hey, this is the airline. They're uh, directing the, everyone in the airlines because it, it like a lot of people are saying it's a Delta. This, uh, this nose wheel is actually on Delta. They're like, Delta should be checking these planes. Mm hmm. Well, they brought all this DEI stuff up, and, uh, and I'll tell you the problem fundamentally, which is. I don't know if any of this has to do with any like affirmative action hires or something. It's just when you start putting that idea in the public's head, when you say the next vice president's gonna be female of color, then we all go, oh, so is she that qualified or right. is she that? And when you announce that uh, by the year 2030, half of our pilots at United Airlines are gonna be w people of color and women, then then we gotta walk into the cock, we gotta walk on a plane and see the two black chicks in the cockpit and go, are they really the most qualified? Now, it's They may be. But you guys introduced those ideas Exa yeah, into correct. our head. And, and when we see Claudine Gay get in front of Congress, your very first thought is, is she the wisest? Is she the smartest? Is she the most qualified? She's the most qualified? Now, I don't, I never met her. And at that time, I had no idea about plagiarism or what her history or credentials were. So I had no thoughts other than, it's all three women? All three women present. Huh, not a dude in there. Oh, and Harvard's got the black chick. Hmm. I'll bet she wasn't the most. Now, I don't even want to go there. And again, the beauty of sports, because when you fucking turn on the NFL Sunday and all 11 players on the defensive side of the ball and the Ravens are black, you never have a thought. <laughs> not one thought. There's not one ginger. Come on. There's not one husky white guy that couldn't be playing cornerback. Come on. Yeah. Never. You never have the thought, but you've now forced us to have this thought. And shame on you. And the th once again, we didn't not make any progress on gender and race relations without this stuff. We made a ton of progress. We had gotten it to a place where everyone was pretty well positioned. Go look at go look at uh, polls taken from various ethnic groups about race relations in the late 2000s, early 2010s. They're all extremely positive. Sometime around 2013, that chart starts plummeting, okay? Introducing these ideas is what has made everything so divisive. It's what's yeah. contaminated the relationships between people and groups, <clears throat> and it's just made everything worse. You want to know why, though? That why is think? what propelled it. Think or no? A condescending think. I know. What do you think? <laughs> No. What do I know? Very sure. I'd like to know, know what you know. Sure. I'll tell you what In I know. In many realms. Okay. I'll tell you what I know. What I know is this country had always used the yardstick to measure when racism was completely through and over and we could stop talking about it. It was the election of the first black president. That's, that was, it wasn't 
even really anecdotal. It was anecdotal, but I mean, when comedians would go, you know, first black president, it wasn't the first black fill in the blank head yeah. coach or anything. When this country decides to elect a black president, that'll be the day we can stop talking about racism and turn the page. It was basically agreed on through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, with a lot of jokes about it's never going to happen or he's going to have to run serpentine you know, to Air Force <laughs> One or whatever. Every comedian, every hackneyed comedian, even Eddie Murphy, by the way, would have a whole routine. Or, Could you imagine a first black president? And they're showing him running, you know, dodging bullets, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. But then Obama got elected and then he got elected to a second term and the second term is when everyone all the hustlers and all the new york times la times all the people that make a living with the grift of racism basically went we got to work overtime now we got to find racism where we're going to start looking under rocks but we are going to go nuts on racism because this is a much tougher task because we're now in a second term of a black president and they went overtime and they went hard and all of a sudden all of a sudden, boulders at colleges became racist symbols, stuff you never even thought about before. Oh, uh, the, the uh, pull rope and the NASCAR paddock was, had a loop on it. You know, that's a that, that could have been a noose, you know, or somebody hung up hoops at a park in Oakland. That must have been that must be a noose. You know, Our, we the media. And mostly Democrats went, okay, we got to get this hustle. We're losing our grip on the hustle. Now it's all fucking focus here. And we all went nuts. It was so much better before Obama got in and and then hit its peak when he left. And then they all went, now it's a full-time job for us, this whole racism yeah, thing. You ever hear the term white privilege before 2013? No. No. That's a grotesque term. That's yes. who on who, the fucking balls on anybody to use that term to try to just like implant the notion of somebody having elevated like uh, uh, your that your your life quality is a function just of that. It's like no people's life. The quality of a person's life is the function of dozens of different elements, right? Yeah. And it's just like to to assume these things about people based on the color of their skin. Didn't we spend 30, 40 years trying to get rid of that? One hundred percent. So there you go. We got a two term black president and all the two-term. hustlers went, all right, now I got my work cut out for me. Uh, Matt, our next guest is uh, queued up in the waiting room, so let me give you a plug. The prevailing narrative, that's Matt Belinsky. Uh, Check out his tweet at Matt Belinsky as well. Get to the bottom of this, or at least be caught up on all that's going on with the Times and and much more. Thanks for uh, coming in on short notice. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Very interesting. Omid Malik is going to join us. He's got a lot to say, and we'll talk to him right after this. Morgan and Morgan, it's 2024, so let's talk about something important. If you get hurt this year, your injury could be worth millions. If you're ever injured, you can check out Morgan and Morgan, America's largest injury law firm, over 100 offices nationwide, and more than 1,000 lawyers. More then $20 billion recovered for 500,000 plus clients. Morgan & Morgan has a proven track record of fighting to get you full and fair compensation. They've been fighting for the people for over 35 years. Look, racing my vintage cars, that can be hard, or at least I make it look hard. Submitting an injury claim with Morgan & Morgan, why that's easy. Morgan & Morgan, right Dawson? If you're ever injured, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. For more information, go to ForThePeople.com slash Adam or dial pound law, pound 529 from your cell phone. That's F-O-R-ThePeople.com slash Adam or pound law, pound 529 from your cell. This is a paid advertisement. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Meho! There's something I'd like to see you do before you die. I'd love it if you took a bottle of whiskey, grabbed the cork out with your teeth, spat it out, took a swig, and then gazed off into the distance. Get it all, man. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. 
Omid Malik, attorney, author, activist, is joining us. Omid has a very interesting story that we'll uh, get into. Uh, thanks for joining us, Omid. Oh, my pleasure. Great to see you, Bert. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I was talking to an associate about you, and uh, he said that uh, you were essentially an investor, an investor in media, sort of a group to invest in media. I think you're in sort of early with Tucker Carlson. Is that correct? Um, yeah, he was a good friend of mine, and absolutely we helped him uh, with his new endeavor. And you had a bit of a renaissance, I mean, or an awakening or something during COVID, perhaps? Absolutely. Like many of us, that was an epiphany for me. Uh, and I realized that the Bill of Rights is something we all need to care about when they start to try to strip that stuff away. And COVID was the time I saw that. That's right. Yeah, it, it saddens me that more Americans didn't react like you. Uh, we lost friends um, and, uh, you know, pretty much a lifelong New Yorker was in New York City. Uh, during that time, I'm, I'm not sure if you were in Los Angeles during that period, they responded probably similarly as stupid as New York did. So, and I actually had gotten married uh, in October of 2020 in Montecito, um, which you probably know about because it's not far from LA. A uh, beautiful place, but during COVID, since it was at the height of it, they didn't allow dancing at my wedding. <laughs> So, I'm sorry for laughing. Yeah, I just, you know, I hadn't actually told that story. And I just remembered the other day when I was talking to my wife and it was like COVID really, my, my family's from Iran. And uh, as you know, there was a revolution there in 1979 that really changed the country. And you started having uh, people have to wear, you know, hijabs, women to show their piety. And I saw a lot of parallels between that revolution and what was happening during COVID in that Fauci was like the Ayatollah and those hijabs became like the masks that people were wearing, which were religious symbols yeah. because they actually had no effect whatsoever on really doing anything. But people wanted to show their piety. And so dancing was forbidden, even though it's meaningless. Yeah. And the guy himself just the other day admits that they made up six feet apart. Right. You heard right. that. Sure. So, you know, how can anyone have confidence in so many of our institutions when it's so clear that they lied to us intentionally during that period of time. And so, yeah, that's a long-winded way of, of answering your question that at that time, I knew I had to put my money where my mouth is uh, and help you know protect liberty from the private sector. Yeah, I, I think you got in at the right time. I've been talking about this for a long time and you know, I started to kind of catch on to this years ago and I would just start speaking my mind and I live in LA and try to navigate Hollywood, or at least I did. And I had a lot of people explain to me that I needed to shut up. And um, I would always tell them, look, uh, the day I don't say what I want to say is the day I go back to swinging a hammer. I, I was a carpenter. I have a profession. I have a skill. I could go back to that. I'd take a little haircut in the pay department. But I was like, I didn't get into this not to say what I want to say. Now, I didn't say what I said was right. I just, it's what I want to say. And I don't like, I don't want you getting in between me saying what I want to say. Uh, it turns out I'm right all the time, but that's still <laughs> a sidebar. And I was amazed that how many creatives caved almost immediately, and especially comedians. Comedians, I was, I was most disappointed in comedians because comedians hold this in very high regard. They go, you know, Lenny Bruce, the cops were at the club and he said what he wanted to say and they arrested him on stage, you know, but they, but they speak with reverence. They speak like they're talking about Martin Luther King and a in a civil rights march, you know, or they, they, every comedian they have great reverence for is never, oh, he sucked the corporate teat and did what the man told him. It was always this rebel thing. And then COVID hits and I'm living in a town full of comedians and none of them will say a word about it. And it was very, it was alarming and, and disappointing. Rage against the machine requiring a vaccine passport to go to their show. Right. Like th right. this is an upside down world that we live in. Right. I mean, for those of us, I don't think you and I change. We're probably the same person or people we were in the 90s. It's that 
everything got out of whack. I started hearing the comments you guys were saying in the last segment. I'll pick up on that for a moment. You guys seem to be identifying this kind of race stuff around 2012. No doubt that might have been the foundation. It got out of whack, though, with the election of Donald Trump. And, and I actually think it's much more intentional and nefarious than people are giving credit. If we recall in 15 and 16, populism was really taking hold in our country uh, across the political spectrum. So it wasn't really, and it isn't anymore about Democrat versus Republican. Those labels are meaningless, in my opinion. What it was is that people had gotten the short end of the stick for the last 16 years in this country for a variety of reasons. And you had Bernie Sanders on one side and Donald Trump on the other. That's horrifying to the oligarchs or the folks in charge. And when Donald Trump won and, and shocked the system the way that he did, I think that oligarchy class, that globalist class that really doesn't give a shit about America, decided that we need to create some sectarian violence in this country. There's no doubt that that's why exactly that time you see the Me Too movement, the BLM movement, COVID, all of these things that are trying to divide people across gender, race, vaccination status to make us fight with each other is done at a time where they needed to have us do that so that there wouldn't be this unifying cross-sectional socioeconomic transcendent populist movement. And I see it from, as I say, coming uh, and having parents from the Middle East, that's where you do in those countries. You try to divide those people so they fight and they don't focus on what's going on at top. And what's totally disappointing is you're right. The people that I used to respect when I was against the Iraq war in 2003 are all now corporatists. And it made no sense to me that they don't want to go up against the people that we were all going up against 15 years ago. I'm the same guy. It's not like I've become right wing. It's just that if you want to be irreverent now and actually question what's going on, you're automatically labeled as that. I would always say to my fellow Californians, especially the industry types, I would go, listen, Donald Trump is not the man. Gavin Newsom is the man. He's the one who's closing the schools, the beaches, the churches. He's the one that's putting small businesses out of work. It's Gavin Newsom. Your guy's the man. Trump doesn't have any control of it. You want to fight against the man, go fight against Gavin Newsom. Of course, none of them took me up on it. Because at the end of the day, essentially, people are greedy cowards. They want yes. money and they're scared. Or they're yes. scared and they want money. They're, the, it's the two greatest attributes I realized from my fellow Southern Californians is greed and fear or fear and greed or fear of not making money or fear of being ostracized and then not being able to make money. It's just all money and fear. And when it's all money and fear, it, they're super easy to control. What's the point of having money, though, if you have to still be a sheep, though? Isn't the whole point of making money is to not have to be that way? Well, what I always say is... Uh, Good money. People always talk about fu money, like yeah. uh, Elon Musk. Yeah. He's got fu money. No, no, yeah. he's got better. He's got f me money. He's got f Elon money. He can buy. So, he can buy Twitter for yeah. you know forty billion dollars, and it's only worth twenty billion dollars. <laughs> and that's called f me money. He can right. eat all that money to say I own this platform, and I'm just keeping it keeping it open to people who want to speak their mind. Right. I have so much money. I don't care if I harm my own financial prospects. And that's fuck me money. I mean, in a way, Donald Trump's the only politician that went into office and came out poorer. Right. That's fuck money. Too. Fuck me money. Right. So right. F fuck you money. I'm going to have this conversation with my kids when I get home. But <laughs> fuck you money is nice. Fuck me money. That's rarefied air. And yeah, you're not going to get there. We're, we're working on it, though. But that's where you get the truth. Yes. A hundred percent. 100%. But again, just like you, I, I'm cut from exactly the same plot. That's how you started the conversation. You'll go back and do something else if you have to, if you ever had to give up your free speech or the ability to speak your mind. I'm exactly the same way. I could care less. It's not worth it to me. Right. I, that, did I do all of this? There's no point. And what's really scary to me right now is what they've done with all of those artificial astroturf movements I'm talking about that mm -hmm. are meant to divide people. It's mm -hmm. also meant to scare people. Yes. To keep them weak. So what ends up happening is that the only people that can have these kind of conversations that you and I can, because we do have some level of money, are the people who can't speak are the ones that don't have money because they're worried about losing their job. So they threaten them. 
And then Biden goes and tries to put a vaccine mandate on people in their private business through OSHA and says, if you don't take this, you're going to lose your job. Thank goodness that the Supreme Court determined that was unconstitutional. Yes. But that's authoritarian. Yes. That's what the authoritarian. Is. Right. Then they talk about overreach. But they're not right. talking about that. Well, I have a theory that I like, and uh, I only like it because I was interviewing Greg Gutfeld, I don't know, nine months ago or something, and he tapped into it. He was like, that's a really interesting theory. And it's something I thought about when you were talking about going back to doing what you did because you you weren't you wouldn't compromise your freedom of speech. I my theory is the following. Um, you're good at what you do, and when you're good at what you do, you you're not as fearful about being outcast or canceled or what have you because if you're, I always say, if you're a really good metal fabricator and yeah. there's their guys are just, they can take aluminum and shape it into a fender of a 1954 Ferrari Testarossa. You know what I mean? If that's your job, you're not really ever, f you never have fear of being let go or canceled or shit can because you have utility and there's always going to be someone who wants to hire you. And I feel that way when it comes to voices as well. The people, the aforementioned Tucker Carlson, he just go, I'm going to say what I want to say, and you can fire me from Fox or you can fire me from cable news, but I will go find a home somewhere because I believe that I'm better than the guy in the cubicle next to mine. Um, and many of the people that you see ending up on Substack and on all these different platforms they're, they're there because they like freedom of speech and they're there because they want to speak their mind. But there's, some, there's something in the back of their head that goes, I can survive this. I'm that good. And I don't think that is most people. Most people live in the middle. They're ha they want their job. They want to keep their job. And they're hanging on with both hands. And they don't feel like they could just step out of the New York Times and hang their own shingle and start their own business and make more money and have more security. And so those people are easily manipulated. And that's what we just saw. It's what we just saw. And it's also the way that, as I said, the, the, the powerful class wants it that way. They want people working at these large, faceless, multinational corporations that have now become quasi, just like the universities, indoctrination centers. You go to work, you're supposed to go do your job. Instead, half your time is listening to HR teach you the way you're supposed to speak now. Right. And so the people are scared to do anything about that. I think it's, I love your, your theory. I totally agree with that. You got to have the mentality that De Niro had in the movie Heat, which is the moment you feel the heat coming around the corner, you can, what is it, five seconds flat, you can just go. Right. And, right. and you don't care. If you have that mentality about anything, you're going to be OK. The problem is, is most people aren't in your own heat. They, they don't they don't understand the message he was trying to say in that scene when he was telling Pacino that. And I think that's something to live by, that you don't give a shit. You have values, you have principles and you're not malleable. And look, that's why the things that I'm doing, uh, you know, one of the things that I think you've been talking about is like, why are we giving money to these corporations that hate us? You know, what are alternatives? And that's something I've been super passionate about. One of the companies I just took public on the New York Stock Exchange is called Public Square. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but it's meant to be a response to Amazon. When you buy our products in this one company at Amazon, you are necessarily funding the Chinese Communist Party. Most of the crap you get there is made over there. What we mm -hmm. did at Public Square, which is now on the NYSE, it's the largest digital marketplace for small and medium-sized American businesses in the country. So if you want to buy a good or a service, you can now just log on to Public Square on the website or the app and find one of 80,000 businesses that you know are small, medium-sized businesses that were shut down during the lockdowns and are American. So this is the kind of stuff that we want to innovate and lead to help the middle class, which is the foundation of this country, and it's the one that's under assault. Uh, along with the family, by the way. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, my feeling and the metaphor I would always use when, when people were telling me to shut up, I would say, you know, there's a lot of people out there who agree with me, but it was considered sort of taboo to say the things I was saying. And I would say, but if half the country believes in me and what I'm, what I'm saying, then why stop saying it? And 
I, I you find you find it with the late night shows. You know, um, Gutfeld was number one. I mean, they move them to a different time slot. I don't know if it's apples to apples anymore. But the the point is, is Gutfeld and and I lived in this world. You know, the late night world for a while, and I've done everyone's show. Gutfeld is not more skilled or, or more honed production or finer comedian or has better writers. He has far fewer writers. He has no budget, no writers, and nothing other than an alternative to what the others are. So yeah. uh, what I always said is if there's five Italian food places on, on the block, all you have to do is open a Mexican food place and it'll be busy. And someone will go, is it good Mexican food? And I'd go, doesn't matter. It just has to be serviceable Mexican food, and there's always going to be a line. So with that in mind, I feel like there's a sort of financial parallel there as well. If all we're doing is this, then go do that. And I think it's happened. It's happening. It's going. It's it's happening faster. And guys like you are going to be a part of that. Could not agree more. I, I love that analogy. That's exactly right. I mean, and that's the thing. It's it, it's it's even in a way almost even worse than your than your than your metaphor with the Italian restaurants. It's what if all of these people were catering to five percent of the population? Right. In that, you know, you go on Amazon Prime and you're looking for a new movie, and it's about black transgender voices. Like, right. and that's what we're seeing as far as content goes. And so it's even less than half the country that the largest outfits are either selling to or trying to produce content for. So you're like, what is going on here? Now, in the world you come from, a lot of that is Hollywood now making movies for foreign countries like China as opposed to Americans and, and other types of profit motives. But, but again, it's like totally uneconomic. And before we got into this, where we were investing in people like Tucker or Public Square or all these companies that were trying to give options for people, I just looked at Trump voters, the 73 million, and I was like, what percentage of GDP just to these people that they say are like the dregs of society represent? I found out it was 30 percent of American GDP, which is seven trillion dollars. If you looked at that on the graph of the world, that's the third largest economy of the world behind China. So I'm like, OK, no one is talking to them. In fact, they're insulting. them. So why wouldn't you do exactly what you're saying? and start selling or creating that Mexican restaurant. If everyone else is gonna go and try to do this bizarre stuff, then there are plenty of products and services that could cater to these folks. And it's a third largest economy in the world. I'll take that all day over going over to Vietnam or some other foreign country. It's right here in America. And we basically bifurcated um, and, and they want choice. So. I think what we're doing is really as American as apple pie. It's about capitalism and choice and financing companies that just believe in the Bill of Rights and don't believe in censorship. And so, you know, I am all about what you're saying. I think that this is the future. And look, you might lament it like, oh, it's too bad that the country's divided. We didn't start the fire, man. We, we didn't push it in this direction. We didn't push ESG down their throats for 12 years like they have to us. People are at a breaking point and there's going to be a reckoning and a backlash because it's not just 73 million people. The majority of the country believes what you and I are saying on this conversation. And we just need to give them more voices like yours and more corporate options that I'm trying to finance for them to be able to feel like they're not funding their opposition. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things that were sort of headwinds for folks like you and folks like me that weren't helping and it was sort of retarding progress for a while, which is all of the Hollywood and the creativity, it's all a sort of coastal thing, you know? So everything was sort of being seen through a certain lens and all the fashion and all the culture, you know, it was basically who is, who's in charge of the culture? LeBron yeah. James, you know what I mean? <laughs> all right, well then whatever he says, that's, that's what we'll do. So that was a, difficult thing to get past like initially there's a kind of a, a cultural aspect of it um but obviously as the other names emerge and truth start to start to be it start to come out through the pores of society 
it changes. But the cultural thing was a, a really tough thing. And every, everyone who was in charge of the culture, whether it was Jon Stewart or LeBron James or Oprah or, or Obama, the Obamas or whatever, they were all in charge of the culture. And so people inherently don't want to be shunned by the culture. They want to join the culture. They want to be embraced by the culture. So if the culture is BLM and the LGBT, whatever community and whatever LeBron James is spouting off about this week, that, and, and then we should all try to be embraced by it and join it. So that that's wearing off fast, but that was a big, big issue and, and slowed, slowed everything down, I think, initially. I think you're right. Politics and business is probably downstream from culture, to your point, mm-hmm. or at least there's this vicious circle to it because, you know, the LeBron James of my childhood is Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. He never said anything about politics. In fact, remember, his quote is, I don't talk about politics. Republicans buy sneakers, too. Right. That was his quote. You would never have that now, although it's interesting to see what LeBron likes to talk about and what he doesn't. He'll never say a bad word about the CCP, right. the Chinese. Never. So that's the selective part of this that started to demonstrate what you're talking about, which is the so obvious hypocrisy with these guys that they wouldn't call out their benefactors. They would just go after the weak people that they knew they could hit and perpetuate these problems. And so I think what's happened is when you start to see people that at one time actually were speaking truth to power, think about the transformation of the Keith Olbermann. All right. I mean, this guy's totally off the reservation now. But again, it might be weird for people if he was actually very vocal against the Iraq war and the Bush administration and, and did some very compelling pieces in the early 2000s. Another guy uh, was who I can't stand now is Colbert. Yeah. He did his like act. I don't know if you recall this in 06 or, or so. He went to the White House correspondence dinner in character yeah. with George W. Bush right next to him and just completely embarrassed the president in a way that no one really had the guts to do back then Mm. and was actually outrageous. Now he's got this late night show and he's dancing like a monkey for Pfizer. Yeah. You know, the the other thing that I think always put folks like us, and I'm not saying right wingers, I'm saying normal people. (laughs) That's the Norm Macdonald quote, right? When they're asking him like, right. Cisgender mean, he's like, oh, no, that's just a word they use to make normal people feel weird. Right, right. So <laughs> I, you know, I'm not right wing. I would consider myself normal, although, right. you know, that may be convenient, but I've always considered myself normal. <laughs> um, they took advantage formally of us wanting to get along and get on with it. They yeah. took advantage of us. And this is a thing You'll understand it in dynamics. If you ever had a shit roommate who caused a, had a fit about everything, it was a real pain in the ass, which I have, at a certain point, you'll start washing his dishes. And you'll do it because you just don't want to deal with him, you know? And you'll start bending over backwards just because I don't want to deal with this person because what you want is peace and you want to live your life and you want normal. So the thing about normal and or, you know, basically religious people, Republicans in general, and then normal people is they just want to raise their family. They want to get the fuck on with their lives. They don't want to have an argument about everything. And they want to just keep their head down and keep going. So they're at a disadvantage because the non-normal people who want compliance will get in their face. And the next thing you know, because your daughter's throwing a fit during COVID, you'll go, fine, I'll wear the surgical gloves when I go into the supermarket. But it's a lot of, fine, I'll do this. A fine, I don't want to deal with that anymore. The problem is, is they kept encroaching. Their demands got, you know, to the point it's a basically Israel Hamas situation. You know, the Israels will do Israel will do whatever they can to have peace 
with Palestine and Hamas. They, they will. They'll do any compromise they can put on the table, but eventually you're going to cut some fences and start slaughtering people and raping people. And now we're going to have to do what we don't want to do, which is get in tanks and go destroy you. And I feel like the progressive left has done essentially the same to the normal people who just want to get the fuck on with it. I don't want to have to memorize your pronouns. I don't want to remember another letter that you've added on to the LGBTQ plus you know, community. You want to regulate this. You want to tell me I have to wear a mask alone on a horse trail on a hot day when I'm hiking, you're closing beaches. And what you've done is successfully got all the normal people to go, okay, fuck it now. Now it's going to be a fight. And then they go, oh, you want to fight? And it's like, no, we don't. We have a limited amount of time on this planet. We'd like to get the fuck on with our lives. But you prevented us from doing that. And yes, now you will get a fight. And the problem is, is the normal people are smarter than the dingbats with the shit policy. You're taking all these people that have very strong intellects, and you're now essentially weaponizing them. They wanted to be left alone. They wanted to get the fuck on with it. it. Jordan Peterson wanted to do his psychology in Canada and be left alone, but you wouldn't, do, you wouldn't let him. And now he's going to take his considerable intellect and he's going to aim it toward you. And so is Ben Shapiro. And so are many of these, uh, Tucker Carlson, many of these other people. And now you're going to feel it. And that's where we're at. You know, it's... The example is, let's say, the kind of religious conservatives of middle America were very comfortable with, in their mind, New York and California being modern day versions of Sodom and Gomorrah in the way that they really look at it. They're like, OK, you know, that's their right. They're going to do what they do there. But the left wasn't content with the baker in Kansas not selling the cake to the gay couple. Right. That had to that's, that's right. Okay. So it's it, it's not live and let live at all on the other side. It's shut up, comply. I have no respect for your religious views, for your personal liberty. You're going to do what we want you to do, even though I have no understanding of your local community whatsoever. And that's honestly the tension we have here, which is, are we going to let this country that's predicated on federalism thrive? Or is there going to be this oligarchy and this leviathan that is going to, from top down, push this stuff onto the regular people, hurting the middle class and the family, which is what made the United States a special country that it was. And to your point, people like us have had it and we're gonna fight back. And, and you know, I am a political refugee from New York to Florida. So at the height of COVID, I said, I'm done with this. I'm moving my family, my considerable intellect businesses will all now occur in the state of Florida. So there's almost like a brain drain that's going to incur. And you have to take my word for it. Look at the finances of California and New York and what they've lost from a tax revenue perspective. And they're, they're all basically broke. And by the way, they would have gone broke in 2020 because of their conduct during COVID. What ended up happening that no one talks about is because the Democrats not only won the presidency, but both chambers, they passed that bailout of $2 trillion that created inflation in March of 21. And in that bill, they pegged the amount of aid that states got was to how high your unemployment rate was. Right. So if you shitty state during COVID that locked down Newsom Cuomo, you got more money. Right. Yeah. So we basically subsidize their draconian, asinine behavior, and all of us paid for it. Yeah. You brought up the baker in the Midwest, yeah. you know, masterpiece cake baker outside of Denver, Colorado. Just a religious guy, great baker, did some shows in Golden, Colorado, came by, gave us a lemon cake. Wonderful lemon cake. Wonderful lemon cake. Nice guy. Just wants to bake his goddamn cakes and get on with his life. Then the gay couple comes in and they need the gay wedding cake and he tells them he's religious and they can't do it. They can't go across the street and get a gay wedding cake. They have to sue him. Then the heterosexual couple comes in and they want a transition cake for their son that's becoming their daughter. And the next thing you know, this guy's in the Supreme Court. This is what we this is what I'm saying. I'm not religious. Leave the guy alone. He bakes a cake. He has a business. He pays taxes. He prays to some God that I don't recognize. I don't care. He's a good citizen. We don't need to go to the He's Supreme to Court. It's, for, it's his First Amendment right, right? It's not just freedom of speech. It's freedom of your religion as well. Yes. So you're upon his religious conviction. Right. Does this guy want to fight with you in the Supreme Court 
over years. No, but you won't leave him alone and stop blaming him. That's you. That's what they, you must wake up to. This guy wants to run a bakery and be left alone. But you won't leave him alone. What, what is exciting about this is that, you know, you and I are meeting each other. You're doing what you're doing. Tucker's doing what he's doing. Joe Rogan's doing what he's doing. Bobby Kennedy's out there. Right. Rand, Glenn Greenwald. Th- this is the future. This what? is the future, and it was, it's was it been created by you yeah. overzealous pricks. Yeah. You created but, Glenn Greenwald. You created yes. him. Yeah. And all Who these was, names. You've created uh, all these people and yeah. all these other platforms. Yes. Rumble. Rumble. All, all of them. Parlor. All of these outlets you created. They would have stayed on Google and Facebook and all the other uh, – watch CNN and we could have left it all alone. But you got way over your skis and you created this. And it's going to come back and bite you in the ass. And it's because happening now. That's exactly right. And, and look – you know, as I think Rahm Emanuel once said, don't ever let a good crisis go to waste. So I'll take his advice on at least that and say, thank you for the green fields. I'm going to now, as you said, make sure that normal people have products and services that they can patronize. That's my mission that are not the way that Twitter, Instagram and Facebook acted during COVID, taking their orders from the federal government to suppress citizens' First Amendment rights. OK, that's a violation of the Constitution because the government can't use a private actor to circumvent and destroy our constitutional rights. That doesn't work. So what we're going to do now is finance companies that are going to believe in liberty. And that's our fund. The one that gave them the money to Tucker is called 1789 Capital. It's named after the year the Bill of Rights went into effect because that is the most important document we have. The vast majority of other countries we compare ourselves to don't have a bill of It's what makes us Americans. And so that's what we've got to preserve. I agree wholeheartedly. Let me steer people to your website. Favarhar, am I saying that right? Well, that's one. The one they might be more interested in is Mm -hmm. 1789capital.io, which is the website about the fund that we make these investments. Or if they want to hear some of my other points, they can just follow me on Twitter at at real Omid Malik. And that's where... I'll put a lot of the stuff that I'm doing uh, on the business and political side. And Public Square as well? Yes, publicsquare.com. Very excited about that. That's a great way for anytime you want to buy a product or even hire a plumber or anything, you can just go on publicsquare.com. It's just like Amazon, but you know every time you're using it, you're patronizing an American small or medium-sized business. Well, Omid, I'm coming out to do Tucker show maybe sometime in March. So uh, maybe uh, we'll swing by your neck of the woods and get a drink. Yeah. And I think you, uh, you might be doing a show in West Palm too. Maybe. Yeah. I'm not doing a stand up okay, show. I'll, I'll come by and, and definitely uh, uh, say hello. I'd love to, to see you in person then too. Thanks. Omid. that was a great conversation. Thanks Adam. Thanks everyone. Take care. All right. That was Omid Malik and yeah. huh? Matt Belinsky. Wow. A pretty heady show today, man. Woo! Lot to say. Lot to say, these guys. But you that's too. all I'm saying. When you hear them talk, and then you hear what's her name about the catalytic converters, uh-huh. forget about the subject. Don't they just seem a little sharper? Sharper, sensical. <laughs> uh, yeah, forget about the subject, just the way they speak. Right. Makes more sense, right? It's a little more linear. Yes. Okay, so chances are they may be right about more things. That's all I'm saying. Sure. All right, Vegas, coming up tonight. Ooh. Come on out, Jimmy Kimmel Comedy Club, two shows, and then Grand Junction Mesa Theater. That'll be Friday, two shows. And Saturday, Essence Park, Colorado Stanley Hotel, two shows Saturday. Naples, Florida, coming up February uh, 2nd and 3rd, four shows. Go to amcrow.com for all the live shows until next time it's Adam for uh, Omid and for Matt and for Chris saying mahalo <laughs>